So um, this is joint research with uh, my PhD student, Daniel, who's sitting here, um, looking at um, uh, the major uh, spot and derivatives exchanges and the information flows between them. If anybody wants a copy of the slides, I can uh, send them afterwards. Also a preprint of the paper. Um, just get in touch with Daniel. The contacts are at the end of the talk. So this is the uh, title of our talk, and you can see the progress with these little dots in this uh, standard latex um, presentation. So these are the questions I'm going to answer. Uh, the first is, which crypto instrument on which exchange is the first to incorporate new information? And actually, sometimes I use the term instrument, sometimes I use the term product. Obviously, spot is neither an instrument or a product, but um, it, w this term is used interchangeably. So I'm talking about all the crypto-related, based in Bitcoin, um, uh, volume that is traded across the major exchanges here. Um, and where are the most informed traders located? Are they more speculative traders? Or um, w what sort of exchanges are seeing the price leadership? And when you spot a, a leader, how long do you have? If you're not trading on, say, Huobi Futures, you're, you're trading Coinbase Spot, how long do you have to follow that large price move? And we've built the infrastructure for this using some pretty advanced econometric techniques, but there isn't a single equation in the talk. So those are the three main questions. Um, and starting off with just um, the exchanges that we cover. So for the futures, we're looking obviously at Barked, but that didn't start until September. The CME, BitMEX, Deribit, Huobi, Kraken, OKEX, and all of these, the major um, volume is on the quarterly futures, although Many of them do, do weekly or even bi-weekly futures contracts, but the volume is really focused on the quarterly, so that's what we're looking at in the futures. And then we've got the perpetuals, which are very close to spot. The interest rates reset every eight hours, sometimes every four hours, um, and so the basis is, is very much smaller than it is on the futures. And then these are the spot exchanges. There's um, Binance um, US, not Binance uh, uh, as it is, because there's a lot of tether flows out there, which I think rather distort the results for, that we would get from, from Binance. And there's Bitfinex, Bitstamp, Bittrex, Coinbase, Exmo, Gemini, Itbit, Kraken, and Oikoicoin, and everything is about the Bitcoin US dollar contract. No tether and no other der derivatives. We're just looking at those contracts on the futures and the perpetuals. Here's an overview of the average um, daily trading volume on those uh, different platforms, just looking at January this year. So in the first panel here on the right, 45% Huobi futures. That 45% is about 3 billion USD average daily volume. 30% um, on BitMEX Perpetual, um, uh, OKEX Future, actually no, 30%, BitMEX Perpetual was about 3 billion, so the Huobi Future is, is more than that. OKEX Future, 12% of it, the OKEX Perpetual, another 8%, and then the rest, like the CME Future, Coinbase Spot, Bitstamp, Bitfinex, these are just the others. The major volume is on Huobi Future and BitMEX Perpetual. Within the, the futures itself, you can see that Huobi Futures now account for 75% of the volume, and the rest is basically OKEX and a little bit on CME. In the spot market, Coinbase carries on being dominant. 33% of the average daily volume in January was on Coinbase, but that's still only about $100 million a day, very much smaller. As you can see in panel A, um, a tiny fraction of the total volume is spot trading. And then we have Bitstamp and Bitfinex and Kraken, and the rest are very, very small. And then on the perpetuals, there's um, the BitMEX perpetual, which is 75%. Um, interesting, 
that the OKEX perpetual is only 19% of the average daily trading volume. When we see our results later, we'll remember that, because you might think that the price leadership was merely a function of real volume. As long as it's not wash volume, it's real volume, that's where the price leadership would come from. But actually, no. It seems to be that there are more informed traders trading on different types of exchanges. So I'm not going to put any mathematical equations here, but these are the results that I'll be showing you in graphical form mainly. Um, the generalized information share, there's also the modified information share or just the standard information share. We use the generalized for econometric reasons, um, for a product or instrument, including the spot. So X, it could be the Coinbase spot or it could be the Huobi futures. And the generalized information share for product X represents what happens when some new information arrives to the network. What proportion of the innovation that is um, uh, uh, consequent to that information, so new, new information arrives, you know, Trump dies of coronavirus or something like that, and that new information is then incorporated along all these major exchanges, and what proportion of the total innovation in the equilibrium Bitcoin price across all the exchanges goes to each of those um, products? What proportion goes to the OKEX perpetual? What proportion goes to the OKEX future and futures and so on and so forth? Having presented those results, the last bit of the talk, at the very end, I'll be looking at the impulse response. In other words, when a price jump occurs, say in Huobi Futures or the OKEx Perpetual, how long does Coinbase or um, uh, Bitfinex, how long do they take to respond to that price jump? How long have you got to profit if you want to follow that trade? If there's a big buy order and the Huobi Futures price jumps up, how long have you got to then buy as well and hopefully sell to make a profit? So, the procedure is we um, build, uh, we take a system of n dimensions. So we may look at just all the spots. So there are 10 spot exchanges, n equals 10. Or we may look at the four big perpetuals, n equals four. Or the futures, we'll take the two regulated, the CME and BAC together, um, or the unregulated futures, OKEX and so forth together, that's n equals five. And then at the end, we'll look at the main futures, perpetual spot, and uh, put them all together and uh, do a system of eight. And each one of those multidimensional systems, we build something called a vector error correction mechanism, which is a sort of lagged, um, we have a change in log price that is reflected in its own um, lagged change in log price, so last minute's lagged change in price on this exchange, but also last minute's lagged change in price, I mean last minute's price, on other exchanges. And then something that brings the system all together in what we call a co-integrated system or the disequilibrium term. So that's why it's called an error correction. So enough, they're tied together in the long run. They're co-integrated. they are all got this one common equilibrium price. So when there's a shock on one and it moves out of the equilibrium, they'll come back together in a new equilibrium. And that's the adjustment that we'll be looking at. So we take minute level information. It's difficult to take anything less than a minute because if you don't have large volumes in each minute and the prices don't change, then the results are going to be distorted. Um, we also do robustness checks at 15 minute or five minute level just to make sure that the, the, what we're finding isn't an artifact of having low volumes. And each day, we take all the minutes in the day all the prices and volumes over all these exchanges in our system, so it could be just the 10 spot exchanges that we're looking at in one system. We take them all together and we build this model and then we calculate something called the generalized information share, the GIS, which as I said before, the generalized is what proportion of the total price innovation originates on that product. So it's the price leadership measure, the main price leadership measure. Now, these things jump around quite a lot. So we apply some exponential smoothing in the graphs such as this. So this is going back to last uh, spring. It's almost a year of data. Actually, it finishes at the end of January. We haven't got February's information here. And this shows that 
more or less consistently, Coinbase has an information share of well over um, a fifth, more like a quarter in that 10-dimensional system. Whereas at the other end, Bittrex, the purple one at the top, hardly any information is going to Bittrex first. In between, there's Bitstamp and Bitfinex. Bitfinex has been losing its price leadership, whereas Coinbase and Bitstamp have been more or less holding theirs over the last nine months or so. Bitstamp and Kraken and Coinbase are the ones that um, seem to be the more um, developed uh, in that system. Now, looking at four major perpetuals, there's the OKEX perpetual, the Deribit perpetual, BitMEX, and Kraken, all very similar. We're taking the eight-hour reset ones. Um, and as soon as the OKEX perpetual was launched, it, it had a tremendous effect on price discovery, taking a lot of the share away from the Deribit perpetual with much larger volumes as well. Um, but strangely, the BitMEX perpetual, um, when I first looked at this market uh, with some colleagues in, uh, in the University of Peking, I'm a visiting professor there as well, uh, we were just looking at the BitMEX Perpetual, which had been around, and that had a lot of price leadership on, um, on spot. But that has been declining over the last six months or so. Um, and even though the BitMEX Perpetual still has the largest trading volume by far, as I mentioned here, I said, look at this. The blue in the right-hand corner is the BitMEX Perpetual in January. The green is 19% is the OKEX, and yet the OKEX has the major price leadership. So what is it? Is it speculation? Could it be that the more informed traders that are you know, going in and out for just a few hours, um, these traders, as opposed to hedges, are what's driving that volume? Now, you can measure speculative interest by dividing um, the open interest by half of the volume, because the volumes on futures or perpetuals are opened and closed. That sort of doubles the volume. So you have to half the, the average daily volume. So we've looked at this month by month. We've looked at the average volume and the average daily open interest in, um, uh, 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 sorry, we've done it by month. So we look the volume by month and the open interest by month. And you can see that in the perpetuals, the deribit numbers are much higher. Um, OKEX has been coming down from 25 in September to 17 in January. BitMEX has been more or less, it's been a little bit volatile, but it's more or less around the 20% range. Um, and so uh, the deribit perpetuals are definitely there for hedging. In fact, I was talking to Luke earlier before the panel we just had, and he said, yeah, I mean, our business is options. Obviously, people don't always just use our futures or perpetuals for hedging. They're going to look at other platforms, but that's basically what the futures volume is. They are hedging volume. Whereas the red, and then if we look at the futures, which I'll show you the graphs for in a minute, we can see that Huobi and OKEX, but particularly Huobi, it's seven hours average holding time for one Huobi futures contract in October. 7.28 hours in October. At the moment in January, the average holding time in hours on the Huobi futures was only 7.6 hours. So that's a, an in indication of a large amount of um, uh, speculative volume. So looking at those unregulated futures, Huobi Futures only started in July, and there was, was, was insufficient volume for us to um, uh, start tracking the information share until uh, August. But as soon as we started tracking it, we saw 25% of the information going into just futures was going first to Huobi, and that's because of this spe speculative activity. Uh, at the expense of both the OKEX and BitMets in particular, the BitMets futures contract has um, become much less um, uh, of a leader. Just to look at the comparison with regulated futures, um, so just looking at CME and BARCT, and then these, these graphs, um, these, these bar charts, the yellow is the uh, daily volume on the CME, and the green is the daily volume on BARCT. 
but eventually launched um, uh, at the, in October, and they managed to get a little bit of volume, um, something like a thousand uh, Bitcoin um, per day, nothing like CME's volume, which is going up to about 80,000 Bitcoin a day, but still that's nothing compared with the three billion in USD that is traded on the Huobi futures or OKEx exchanges or, or indeed BitMEX. So very tiny volumes. And you can see that although Bucks made some impression when it first came up more recently, there's virtually no information flowing initially to Bucks. Of those two, it's going first to the CME. But the CME itself has hardly any price leadership in the entire system. So now we combine the eight um, uh, dimensions. We've got Huobi futures, we've got the OKEx perpetual, OKEx futures, and so forth. And the, the yellow is the CME. It represents only about 6% of the price leadership. OK, so Huobi futures, OKEx perpetual, or futures, these tend to be the leading products. So now, let's go to the last question before I take any questions that you might have, and talk about this impulse response function. And it's based on the same vector error correction mechanism, but we do a lot of bilateral ones. So we're looking at, say, a shock in the Huobi futures. So we'll do a two-dimensional VECM from Huobi futures and Coinbase Spot, for example, to see what the disequilibrium term acts like, how long the deviations from equilibrium take to get back to the common equilibrium price. And we'll do that for all the other exchanges. And we don't have to shock just the Huobi futures. We could shock um, Coinbase, or we could, you know, sometimes we've had 100 million um, traded on Coinbase at once. So, you know, we can see what happens when you see that large transaction happening. If you had a model such as this, you would know if you're trading on um, uh, Kraken or Poloniex or whatever, you would know how long you've got to actually follow that trade. So it's a pretty useful tool for any types of traders, or including market makers. So the next graphs are showing the expected percentage spread between the two exchange prices. So, for example, we shock the Huobi futures price by 10%. And these models are built using just January data. OK, we can use whatever data we like to use it. So we've taken the whole of January. I've, on average, the price was about 10,000 USD. So we shock it up 10% on Huobi, and then we see how long the other exchanges took to respond. And you can see that the OKEx future very, very quickly, within a couple of minutes, it's up to within the bid ask spread, within a few bips of the, um, uh, the zero. The others, um, because in January, the futures was pretty much in contango, in other words, um, there's an upward sloping expectation, uh, futures are trading um, higher than spot, then it was about a contango at the quarterly end of about 1%. And so we wouldn't expect the perpetual, which is very close to the spot because it's reset every eight hours, so there's very little basis. But there's a big basis between the Huobi and OKEx that are trading similar levels and um, the others. So the others will, and the one that takes the longest is Bitfinex. You've got about six or seven minutes to trade on Bitfinex before it's going to reach the um, spot price of the other exchanges. And um, what about the OKEx perpetual? Here, the, as I said, the perpetual is more like the spot, and so the contango is going to go down. If you've got a shock in the spot, there won't be such a steep contango. So we don't see a 1% difference at the top here. It's about half a percent because uh, the futures curve has flattened out a bit, but again, these two are going to move together pretty quickly within five to seven minutes, and it's um, Bitfinex that takes longer. And that is all I have to say right now, except if you want the slides or a preprint of the paper, please contact Daniel. Can you stand up? 
This guy here is my PhD. He's done all the number crunching, all the model building, and all the graphs for this presentation. Thank you, Daniel. And the other guys here are working on options, um, ETFs, um, uh, pricing, asset pricing of coins, and so forth, if you'd like to talk to them later on. Thank you very much.